Jamie, Jamie Loftus, queen of the podcast frontier. Jamie, wow. Did you, did you get what that was a reference to? Yeah, it was Davy Crockett. It was Davy Crockett. I never know what you Yankees grow up with. Look, we, we don't really grow up with Davy Crockett, but we, we grow up with uh, Disney movies yeah. that age poorly, so I've, I've heard it. Well, if you're a Texan, that also makes you think of Rusty Wallace, who is a prominent Honda dealer in North Texas when I was a kid and had a song <laughs> about his Honda dealership that was done to the same tune. Really? So, yeah, there you go. Four people who grew up in North Texas at the same God. time that I did. Yeah. There, there is You'll nothing all remember more. those ads. <laughs> There are so few things in this world that can bond two people as quickly as knowing the same local ad. It is like a rare. It's the truest bond. It's the truest it really bond is. that exists. Marriage means it's, nothing next to having both seen, listen to Jim Adler, the Texas Hammer ads before he killed himself. And um, <laughs> I have no idea it's what a, you're it's talking a bleak about, but I'm story, engaged. Jamie. You don't want to hear about the Texas Hammer and what went down. <laughs> Um, the, very the New sad. England uh, ad, ad landscape was was pretty bleak as well. <laughs> I'm gonna guess less bad. cowboy ads. Not none. <laughs> Probably not none. Wherever there Where are, are people, you smoking? Huh? I'm not. Oh, don't <laughs> gaslight me. You just blew. <laughs> Robert, Un- Robert, that was peak asshole. Peak Thank asshole. Okay. Blowing smoke <laughs> into the camera on your computer as Jamie asks you a question. And I yeah. could and I can smell it first of all. Mm-hmm. And it, and I, another thing. I'm smoking was, menthols because I hate me some Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I, else hated Joe Biden, Jamie Loftus? That was so who? Dumb. Helena Blavatsky. Oh, well, oh, she became right. aware of him decades before his birth in her perusal of the well, Akashic yeah, she was Library. Psychic. Yeah, she exactly. was psychic. Yeah, she, she read she, about she, him in, in the ethereal library system that she, exists in her theology. The, uh, um, what is it? one of the esoteric terms I kept coming? It was the like Akashic the, Records, huh? The Akashic Records, yes. Yes, yeah, we'll talk the, about them more much later. Uh, a man she in a diner them. in Florida was trying to unpack the yeah. Akashic Records for me, and I was like, what the, are these? Like, can uh, you describe? And he's like, I, I don't, I don't. Well, you know how, you I know don't how really we started know. <laughs> talking about Cairo and like Alexandria and the Library of Alexandria and like that. The Akashic yeah. Records are the ethereal equivalent of the Library of Alexandria, and Helena Blavatsky invents them. So we're going to be talking about that later. Don't worry. I have, I have found that yeah. people will attribute. Uh, whatever vague thing that they they'll just be like, yeah, it's in the Akashic Records, and that's I'm like, what the Akashic a, Records exists for. It's just so that a you vague can, projection <laughs> yeah. text. Well, I read like, about it in the Akashic Records. There's a future book about it or something. And you're yeah. like, how many how many topics is, <laughs> are it's covered everything. in the Akashic Records? Because it's all over the place. Based well, on it's how every, people it's talk everything about it. that's ever been written. So it's a library outside of time. So like. Mm. You can read about the future by just like reading some history books somebody wrote. It's you know, the way Helena Blavatsky machine. was aware of the fact that Donald Trump in the future would attempt to strangle a Secret Service agent to take control of the limousine away from him on January 6th. <laughs> oh, six. Six, six, six. Um, yeah, because that's got to be in there somewhere. So anyway, <laughs> when we left off, Helena had kayaked her way to freedom and escaped from her. I don't know if evil husband's really the right thing to say because spoilers, he spends the rest of his life like sending her money um, whenever so she asks husband for it. She does not love or Definitely want her husband she does not see as, as someone she wants to be around. And he did lock right. her in a castle, so whatever. That's um, reason enough to not marry someone. Sure, but he does keep sending her money, so I don't know. You can think about it well, however you want. Good. Fin, um, fin, dom, fin dom. Yeah, definitely some fin dom energy going off yeah. here. Also throughout her entire life. So yeah, I mean, she was a scammer. She was kind of fin For the world. about 20 years, she is in the wind, right? Um, mm-hmm. There are stories, and very detailed stories in both of her biographies about everything she was doing during this period of time. We have no way of knowing if any of them are true. We definitely know a lot of them are false. Um, okay. There's a bunch of wild shit in here. She's in like two different boat crashes that kill almost everybody on the boat. This um, is the area of her life I'm more familiar with. Yeah. It's like the wild stories that are unverifiable. Yeah, period. absolutely unverifiable. And there's a bunch yeah. of stories. There's one when she's a little girl, there's a story that she like partly falls off a horse and like should have died, but the spirit saved her. And it's like, man, I had like, I had a horse bolt on me when I was a kid. A lot of kids have a slightly scary experience with a horse or a car or something else that moves faster than things should move. It does. It's not the ghosts, but whatever. Did well, the spirit the save you though? 
No, the horse got back to like ran back to where it lived and then didn't want to run anymore. It was just scary because I wasn't in control. I don't know that I like it's just a horse that decided to run back home. It didn't want to listen to me. Um, It happens with horses, I assume. I never read a horse, rode a horse again. Um, oh, well, fair enough. Well, not for I, any particular reason. I just, it's, it's not a lot of opportunities to ride horses. <laughs> my cousin was riding a horse once at the Jesus horse camp. We used to get scholarships to go to when we were kids and it died while she was riding it. Oh, well, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it just kind of, it just, <laughs> oh, it just that's a beautifully sat down. sad. <laughs> it just gave up. That's it, she that's, sat on a horse and it decided life was done. It just she it, 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 honestly it never so scarring. Again. That's so that's extremely scar- funny. The horse just committed it, suicide. I have secondhand it, trauma. It was really old. It that's, was at it uh-huh. was at a camp in the middle of New Hampshire. Because it'd be pretty fucked up if it was young. So wow, they definitely worked that horse to death. Wow. That's sad. That's, That's actually very yeah. sad. depressing. Um, that but also was yeah. so scans. formative for me where I don't remember any of the Jesus stuff, but I do remember that the, when my cousin sat on the horse and it died. And I remember that for some reason they like, because you would just be doing Jesus stuff, horse stuff, Jesus stuff, horse stuff, occasional arts and crafts, dinner, uh, no contact with the outside world. And you, but there was like one time where we had to watch a horse dental procedure. And I remember being like, I don't want to, can I leave? Why is that and they useful? were like, cause I no. it's like I one said, thing no. if you're like, you need to watch, here's how we shoe a horse or like, but like, you don't, as a horse rider, you're never going to need to learn how to do dentistry on your horse. That's not your job. That's, that's, the, is, that's why you go to a horse dentist. Nor as a Christian nine year old, do you need to watch yeah, a, a horse get not. a dental I, procedure? I bet they taught you more about that than they did about sex though. Um, oh, for sure. When no all sex they ed, needed but I did to do, see a horse Jamie, get a fucking All they canal. needed to do to teach you about sex uh-huh. was slam a big fat subway foot long down on the table and walk there out of that room. There we go. Yeah. That's now, how you teach kids I, about sex. I know we have to talk about Helena Blavatsky, but I do. I've seen this opinion circulating more and it really brings me pleasure to see that people are finally you know, kind of coming around to this, the best food at Subway are the cookies. The cookies no at Subway. Major, are you kidding me? White no macadamia, opinion. white chocolate macadamia hard, nut. Hard agree, Jamie Loftus. Hard no opinion agree. about really Subway. Good. But I do have some opinions Ooh. about the life of Helena Blavatsky. And okay, over the right. next Perfect 20 transition. years after escaping, uh, she goes all over the place. She starts a spiritual uh-huh. society in, in Cairo, which like falls apart in like two weeks. What, what, she, what span of years are we talking This is like 1849 to like 1870 or like 1850, something like that to 18, like 71 or 72. Pre her Um, encountering spiritualism or like. Oh no. I mean, she encounters it as a kid, according to her, right? She's talking to Prince Golitsyn. She's reading her grandpa's occult library. She hung out with those horse nomads. Um, Right. Because it's like, because American spiritualism starts in 1848. So I'm just trying to figure out when she. She is, and she is, she is. So when she starts a spiritual and spiritualism society in Cairo, the first time, it's right mm-hmm. after she starts her visit. They're doing seances. They're doing medium shit. Okay. They're very much doing America. Like spiritualism, like starts in America, gets over to Europe, and then eventually further south later. And like they're doing that yeah. sort of shit in um in in so- Cairo. Um, She's doing the Fox sister shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we're, again, we'll, we'll talk to them. We'll talk about them a bit later. Um, but it's, it is unclear. She, we, we're pretty, it's pretty clear that she attempts and fails to start a spiritual society, mainly because the other mediums start like grifting people, um, and turning it into a cash thing and it falls apart. That's her claim. That's Um, the whole first wave of spiritualism, baby. Might be more accurate to say that the grift just got away from her and she wasn't able to prop. But anyway, uh, she Mm -hmm. goes to Paris, uh, where according to her own recollections, she astonished a group of Freemasons with her depth of occult knowledge. There's no evidence Mm -hmm. of this. Uh, we do know that in 1858, after she's been nearly at 10 years, it's like 1849, something like that, that she she starts her journey. In like 1858, mm. after nearly 10 years, because she comes back home a couple of times for like money and stuff, she tells her sister sure. that she'd spent the last decade as a prostitute. Um, now her sister is also kind of a grifter, so we don't really know, like they have a falling out at some point. It is entirely possible that she spends as her, you know, year... That that's how she finances her travel. There's out. We don't really know how she pays for so, it. I, 
Okay, because I was kind of wondering, I was like, is is she using sex work as a metaphor there, or is she does she mean it in the literal sense? It might be it might be literal. She may have just gotten the money from her husband, who she also visits occasionally during this period, and who apparently okay. sends her money. She comes from a rich family. She probably gets some money there, but what what is certain is that she travels widely throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, and throughout Southeast Asia. Um, Mm -hmm. and that she semi-regularly receives money from someone. And there's a couple of, it's probably a couple of different people, like her family and her dad. Some patrons. She gets some amount of money. Um, and yeah, she's, she's in her, her claim is that she's having like a series of wide ranging, like mystical adventures, um, that Mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, the inciting incident for her spiritual journey in like this period, according to her claim of things, is that in 1851, she meets a teleporting Hindu mystic named Master Moria in London. Sure. Now, she claims she recognizes this guy when she sees him in London because she'd seen him in her dreams and visions, which she'd been having. Again, as a little girl, she's talking about these dreams and visions. She claims she's been seeing this guy for decades in her dreams and visions. And then she meets him at a hotel lobby in London. Uh, and I'm going to quote from Stawazinski again. The man told Blavatsky he'd been waiting for her. It was planned long ago, he explained. They kept talking. Master Moria, for that was how he introduced himself to Helena, explained he had a special mission for her. Madame Blavatsky had to go to a secret school in Tibet that Moria ran together with his friend, Master Kuthumi. After he said that, he literally vanished into thin air. Mm. Now, Blavatsky later claimed that this inspired a series of attempts to try and make her way to the isolated kingdom of Tibet. At this point, Tibet was independent of China and anyone else, and in the West, it was basically mythic as almost no Westerners had ever been there. The kingdom was geographically isolated, and bandits and border guards would either kill or turn back people who tried to enter. The first European woman on record to see Tibet was Alexandra David Neal in 1932. Blavatsky claimed that in the 1860s, she made her way into the country and lived there for several years studying with Kuthumi and Moria. Now... This did not happen. Again, Tibet is a closed society to the West right. at this point. Um, it is occasionally like European diplomatic officials and stuff will go to Tibet, but mm-hmm. you really don't get in easily, and it's very dangerous to do so. Um, there is, however, like weirdly enticing evidence that she might have gotten close to Tibet a couple of times. She claims she tried and oh. failed to get in twice. Um, okay. Lockman traces a couple of enticing leads of a, like there's a couple European officials in India who later will say that they met a woman matching her description near Kashmir and like sat and had like tea with her and hung out for a while and like hosted her for a while. Um, mm-hmm. And sh- we know those t- those Buddhist tribesmen that she met as a girl. She meets again in this period in the Gobi Desert, not wildly far from the Tibetan border. Um, so again, mm-hmm. this definitely didn't happen, but. Like but any good tra- lifter, she gets and close so- enough. There's an like, and because of her backstory, it's like it's not impossible. Uh, of the women in this period, she's maybe one of the only ones who realistically might have been able to get to Tibet. Could she have did have some connections, right? Yeah, that's so. But it's but so much of her mm-hmm. philosophy depends on this lie being true. <laughs> yes, that, like, all of yeah. it, a hundred percent of it. Um, right. She claims that during her years in Tibet, she learned she stays with her Kuthumi and Master Moria in this in their like occult compound. She learns all these ancient mystic secrets uh, and the secret history of the world. Um, and yeah, so this is a very important period of journey for her that she's like she's getting uh, this occult schooling in like, and it's also like in the real Hinduism and Buddhism, right? Like this mm-hmm. stuff that that is not actually. Like she is inventing when she later brings knowledge of like Eastern religions to a lot of Americans. A lot of it shit she invented, but she'll claim. We'll talk about this more later. That like, well, no, they just the the Hindus in India don't know the truth. But I got it directly from Master Moria or from Kuthumi, who like know the real shit. Um, With stuff like this, it's just like, I mean, it's <laughs> there's certainly another big name that comes to mind with this shit. But you're just like, just like. Be a novelist like your mom. Like what? Exactly. Why? Exactly. Write a cool Just, novel about this shit. It's fine. Probably would have been a little yeah. racist, but it was the 1850s oh, for or whatever. Sure. No one's going to do but much like, better than it, you. It's like L. Ron Hubbard shit. You're like, yeah. Just stick to that. Come on. Yeah. No. It doesn't it, have to she, be a religion. She, she does not. So, you know, no. this is a big part of her story. During that like 20 years, she also will claim 
frequently later that she fights alongside Italian revolutionary, uh, I think it's Giuseppe Garibaldi, um, and gets like okay. shot several times. She has some scars on her body that she'll show people the rest of her life and be like, this is where I got shot fighting, you know, with Garibaldi um, mm-hmm. in this in this failed revolution against like the Catholics and the king of, or, or the Catholics and like, yeah, basically it was this like – Revolution to try to gain uh, Italy some independence from fucking Catholicism or whatever. Um, She, yeah, claims that she learned secrets from mystics all over the world in the Middle East and in in Tibet. She goes to the United States. Obviously, she hangs out with indigenous people and learns their mystical traditions and stuff, right? Um, Yeah, and then rebrands it as her own, I'm sure. That we don't, like, who knows the degree to which all of this is true. I I tend to think it's about 15%. Um, Yeah, most likely bullshit and that like yeah she probably like went to a fucking the equivalent of a truck stop uh and like was briefly like shook hands with a navajo person and then wrote lurid stories about how like she was instructed in their traditions and whatnot like that's the kind of person she is you know it's like if that I mean if she did it, she, it's very that, possible if it that wasn't she just, someone in fucking a San Francisco bar who had been to Arizona told her a story and like yeah well it's like also if she was like yeah if she was fraternizing with like white spiritualists in the 19th century mm-hmm. they had, were just making shit up about indigenous people while they were massacring the them yes and so it's just possible that she like talked to them and was like okay yeah. let's just take this at face value even though there's like almost everything. Yeah, uh, spiritualist said at that time was like totally wrong. Yes, um, but- and one so one of the very few solid things we can kind of grasp on during this period is that she takes she moves to Cairo a second time. She attempts to create this is years later a second spiritual society, um, and this okay. is again an attempt. This is when the spiritualist craze is kind of at its height. So she's she's continually trying to cash in on the spiritualist craze in Cairo because there's a lot of like rich dilettante white people in. Living in Cairo, right? Um, Because it's, you know. Yeah, colonizer types. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, And she basically seems to have put together a group of mediums and set them to the task of bilking rubes for cash. Uh, Blavatsky Mm -hmm. was said to have used a long glove stuffed with cotton as a spirit hand, basically puppeting it to, like, do Mm -hmm. things and trick people into thinking she summoned a ghost that was, like, manipulating physical objects. Mm-hmm. That's some of the best of of like both of the waves of spiritualism. That's like some of the greatest stuff because oh, it's, it's like the, well, yeah, it can be a terrific grift. the and, The physical mediumship phase is it's just she, fucking wild. She all she loved. She was big into having a physical dimension. We're going to talk about this a lot over the course of these episodes. Yeah, that um, is no longer the case because it was proven false. Like just so many times yes, that and, most people don't bother. And at this point, I have to note the long glove stuffed with cut stuffed with cotton as a ghost hand was not a good grift trick. Um, it does not seem to have worked Never on many is. people. Uh, yeah. Now. Lachman claims the woman who, like, says this of Blavatsky, that she tried to con people with a big fake cotton hand, was a liar herself. Uh, And again, everyone who is arguing on the negative side of Blavatsky's life is also a con artist, spiritual grifter. So it is, it is, everyone is questionable who says anything about this woman. uh, Most (laughs) physical mediums have have been disproved. But the, okay, the best of, of what I know Because there were, there's like all this, I don't know, like there's all this lore of like, there were a few spiritual, like physical mediums who were never disproven. And then you can like sort of find examples to the case that like they may have been disproven and then paid someone off or like situations like that. But the most convincing spirit hands, which is covered in, uh, I I think we talked about it in your, the episode of Ghost Church you're in. If you're using like animal guts, People will start there. You can't just oh, be yes. a cotton hand. Psychic it's got to be surgery, goopy yeah. and wet. And because for for whatever reason, I, I you, people were more likely to believe that physical mediumship was real if it was wet. And there was like yeah. this common belief that like if you went beyond the veil and reached through to like our dimension, you'd be goopy. And so uh, women would would. Um, yeah. Oh, there was a lot to do with like, yeah, as you talk about in your show, like 
uh, vaginal discharge and like ectoplasm and all this stuff. Like it's a whole yeah. history. Yeah. And it became this like this. I, I'm curious of like what Blavatsky did specifically. But if she's using a bone dry cotton hand, people don't. That's not a show people are yeah. interested in going to. And that's where she is. She's a dry ass medium at this point. But right? I mean, she, yeah, she she's, hasn't, she's not gooping it up. She, the way she's going to figure out how to get America are. very wet, but she doesn't know yet. Also, she's in Cairo. Um, so here's here's Lachman writing about the uh, kind of the claims of Blavatsky's time in her second spiritualist society. Quote, Blavatsky's own account has it that although she was against the idea of contacting the dead, she would allow mediums to perform. Emma Colomb was apparently one of these and then explained to the audience the truth behind the phenomena. What Blavatsky wanted to show was the difference between a passive medium, that is someone who was merely the means by which phenomena could occur, and what she called an active doer, someone who could produce and control the phenomena and not, as with mediums, be controlled by them. In other words, a magician. That is, in essence, what she learned in Tibet, or wherever she was. Yet Helena Blavatsky claimed to be a poor judge of character, at least at this time. Or perhaps her generous nature was taken advantage of, something that will oh. prove to be the case down the line. In any case, while she was away, the mediums, Why, amateurs, been... according to her account, decided to try to fleece the members of the society by staging fake seances. They also drank a great deal, something Helena was decidedly <laughs> against. When she returned and discovered what had happened, she closed the society down, not how However, before a Greek madman who had been present at the only two public seances we held, she wrote, tried to shoot her. She thought he must have been possessed by some vile spook. Although the society lasted only two weeks, the attempt on her life, if it was not an exaggeration. Two weeks? In a, yeah, two weeks. A she goes from She goes from starting a spiritual society to a guy trying to assassinate her and a bunch of mediums like creating a con artist ring God. in two weeks. It's amazing. This is... The, yeah. This, I mean, this does all kind of tr track that she, I mean, yeah. and not to say that the spiritualist mediums were like actually pulling shit off. Statistically, they were not. But there was like, I, I, I it felt to me when I was doing, and again, I didn't get really far in theosophy research, but that it was so, because there was like such a huge controversy around spiritualism and people like it was just it's like the easiest thing to yes. use as like well no, this is fake what i'm doing is real because it just yeah, had such and, a bad and, reputation and that's what this that's what we're building towards here because like she will later claim that this experience and lockman her, one of her biographers will claim that like this experience is what helps her to realize that spiritualism is wrong specifically like this assassination attempt, which she believes is like caused by this guy being possessed by a, a vile spook. Is um, there she, proof that the assassination attempt happened? I'm curious. Absolutely not, Jamie. <laughs> okay, absolutely I was like, not. okay, just checking. <laughs> but this is what Lachman says proves her point. Quote, what her mediums were contacting were not the souls of the dear departed, but a species of astral hobo, psychic tramps with nothing better to do than hover near the borderland Ooh. between the living and the dead, looking for some mischief. It was the insight that would lead to a lifelong feud between Helena Blavatsky and the major spiritualists of her time. And I gotta say, astral hobo, fucking good band name, right? That, oh, yeah. huge in the 90s, huge oh in the God. 90s. Mostly yeah. forgotten now, but really oh, you know, controlled because of that sex the Rhode scandal. Island punk yeah. scene at one time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, they had yeah, that I, concert I'm, where 14 people burned to death, but yes, really good band. Okay, let's <laughs> let's ease off Rhode Island for a second, okay? Because some people were really sad when they learned about that when they were 10 or whatever. I don't... Yeah, anyways. it was sad. Anyway. It, very um, sad. But... I, yeah, it, it makes it there, especially at this time, getting as far away from spiritualism as popular was how a lot of movements started. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and that's, yeah. that is how Blavatsky claims it happens. Um, yeah. And she went on to make something way worse. So there she you go. does a bunch of other shit. Like again, this, there's this whole period. You can read it both in Lachman's and Mead's biographies. You can read many pages about what she supposedly did in this period. I'm not going to get into detail on it because it's okay. almost certainly mostly nonsense. Although she okay. definitely went places and did stuff, and it was probably pretty interesting. I'm going to guess the actual biography of Helena Blavatsky is also quite interesting, just not very <laughs> flattering. Sure. Um, so she, you know, we know she like bums around Europe about her precise moments are unclear, but when she comes up on the historic next definitive, uh, the historic record next definitively, it's in the United States. So okay. we Where's are she pretty sure- 
because there's, you know, government docs and shit, that Helena Blavatsky lands in New York on July 7th, 1873. Um, okay. I've definitely heard some people say it was 1872. I assume Lachman's not wrong here because it's such a documented basic fact. Uh, she's okay. 42 years old. Now, this is not her first time in the United States, uh, according to her. I don't actually know that there's documentation that she visited before, but it wouldn't have been weird if she had gone through the U.S. on her way to India because of how travel worked at the time. Right. Uh, Yeah. Okay. She claims that she was supposed to ride there on a first-class ticket, but gave it up to help a poor family afford the journey. There is no evidence this is true. Mead seems to say this is clearly a lie. Lackman takes it, because again, he's, he's very invested in her being... Uh, uh, a hero to the poor. Um, so she says she arrives with only a few dollars to her name, plus a massive fortune in cash that Master Moria gave her, but that she wasn't allowed to spend, right? She couldn't use it at all. She had to give it to a random guy in Buffalo. Um, there's God. <laughs> cool, because again, she's getting messages, these spiritual, they told her to go to Tibet. Now they're, they keep giving her commands all through her life. So she she gets like told where to find this package of money and she has to take it to Buffalo. Again, zero well, that's, And again, this. again, it's like that's, there's like huge spiritualist like uh, overlap there because it was all like almost exclusively in upstate New York was like where it was popular. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, next, Lockman claims that she basically lives the life of like a stereotypical immigrant to the United States. Quote, her adventures in the next few years are a kind of American success story in which a penniless foreigner arrives in the new world and through courage, persistence, and determination makes good. Um, now, this is nonsense in pa- part because she gets a bunch of family money at some point, but she is, she, she was does rich seem the to entire li- time. Well, no, she seems to have been poor for a while. There were like issues with okay. her getting her money. And like, if you have like okay. an issue getting money mailed to you, that could be years. Um, sure. So she is like living in a working class house both Mead and Lackman claim she becomes like the din mother for this like bunch of immigrants making a hard scrabble living in the late 1800s in New York City. Uh, okay. Now Mead notes that, and and one of the ways in which her story differs from Lock, differs from Lachman's. Mead notes that Blavatsky got the idea to go to the United States during while well, she was in Paris in the spring of 1873, and someone tells her about spiritualism and that it's taken over the United States. This is probably not true because she would have she known about it way before sp- this. Like, it's weird. I don't know. It's a weird claim to make. But Doesn't she seem prob- like this would be something she'd be 25 years late I, to. I, I think maybe the the germ of truth in there is that she probably goes there because somebody in fucking Paris is like, you know where people are making a shitload of money pulling off the grifts that you failed to pull off in New Cairo? New York is City. The, is fucking yeah. New York City. That's where yeah. that shit will work. Yeah. Um, so we should probably talk about spiritualism. There's some stuff you've yeah. been alluding to, Jamie, that uh, maybe our listeners who haven't listened to Ghost Church because they're cucks – don't Fucking know. Fucking cucks. Mm-hmm. Legally, they are, yes. Um, <laughs> Sophie, what? It's time for an ad break, but you're on a roll. Oh, thank you. You know who's not cooked? Oh. Wow. Okay. Wow. Oh, I, you cannot verify wow. that. Wow. You're right. You're yeah, right. Hard to prove. And honestly, fine either way. It's all good. It's all good <laughs> in this hood. We discriminate here. Yeah. Get cucked, get not cucked, be the cuckold, um, be into magpie fetishism. I'm not sure what that is, uh, but no, figure out a way. Someone's going to get into whatever the fuck Yeah, is. yeah, surgically implant an Robert, egg into no. another person. Actually, what? now that you say that, that definitely exists in cartoons. That's got to be a fetish, no, right? There, that has no to be a fetish. Now. Absolutely has to egg be a fetish. Impl- oh, God. Yeah, egg impl- I mean, there are. Oh, there, there is specifically a sex toy just, that, like, you can pump an eggs ad. into somebody with. They're made out of, like, a that's gelatin. That's nasty. That's nasty. I don't like well, it. Well, that's a thing that people just can do if they want to. Just go to an ad break. My God, man. <laughs> yeah, here's some ads. We're back, and we're talking about the sex toy that lets you squirt eggs up in your partner. It's called the ovipositor. You, you make the eggs out of some gelatin <laughs> thing. It's a whole, it's a thing. You can Are look you it serious? up. The you name, can find it. The name, like, makes up for how horrible this entire thing is. <laughs> it it's does. good shit. It's, really it's, good. it's good shit. <laughs> like, I can't I, even be mad. I object. I object, <laughs> but, like, I'm not mad. <laughs> mm-hmm. I that I had a physical response to yeah, Jamie. Jamie literally okay. backed off. <laughs> wow, Ova. That's that's a gnarly name. Okay, 
Well, that's good to dope, know. Dope, dope. Uh, continue <laughs> with the script. Let's move on. So what's, what's okay. going on, Robert? <laughs> okay, so after she invents the ovipos... No, okay. Uh, like most great <laughs> movements in American intellectual history, spiritualism started with the lies of a child. Two children, actually. 15-year-old... I'm, sorry, Mag- I'm looking at the picture of this. Of the ovipositor? I don't like it. Well, Jamie... Thankfully, Kaida, the Supreme the Court will queen. make it illegal soon. Ooh, you're not the names like, are kind of funny. You're also not the like hive this queen. Next paragraph, the Robert's dragon ovipositor, ice serpent, Aquarius the kelpie, We're the off. tentacle ovipositor, the script, is the dragon not dildo, <sighs> Jamie, yeah. Cthulhu Jamie, the sea beast. Come back, come back. He's about to. He's about Sorry. to talk about. Sorry, my girls. Very, your girls. This is the stuff you like. Yeah. Yeah. My 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 foxy ladies. So, these two liars who start spiritualism are okay. 15, okay, relax. Yeah, yeah, let's old, calm that down real quick. Fifteen-year-old Maggie Fox and her eleven-year-old sister Katie. The Fox family lived outside of Newark in that blighted hellscape some fools call New York State. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. They're um, Rochester adjacent. Yeah, they're Rochester adjacent. One one assumes, like most children, they were little shits, and they decided they wanted to scare their mom by creating weird sounds that would echo in their drafty farmhouse. They started by tying strings to apples and then dropping them on the stairs repeatedly to simulate the footsteps of a sort of ghost, which is pretty creative. You got to give them credit. Um, For sure. Maggie and Katie graduated to popping and thumping sounds, often by popping their knuckles or snapping their toes together. They could snap their toes. And dislocating their knees. Yeah, it's like fucked up shit. And they would do it with like even their shoes and socks on, and it was still loud enough that it would like wake their parents up. And they Um, could do it barely moving, which is fucking wild. Over time. I have a feeling I'm going to object to a few of your your broader characterizations of the foxes, but I'm I'm, I will say this of the foxes. If systematic, massive discrimination of women did didn't exist they would have been huge in early hollywood well see i, I totally agree with you or at and least I, in the radio maybe because it's more sound based but whatever yeah there's what there's one fox sister that i think is uh primarily at fault here we'll get there yeah i think the only fox that i would not blame for this is fox Mulder. he's just trying to find the truth anyway um oh i'm gonna quote now from a write-up on history net maggie later claimed that she and katie planned a final performance for their mother in which they would talk to the ghost after the rapping sounds had begun in the evening of march 31st 1848 miss fox rose lit a candle and began searching the house when she reached her daughter's bed katie peered into the darkness and boldly addressed the ghost mr splitfoot do as i do she said snapping her fingers in the cadence of the earlier noises the appropriate raps followed Maggie then clapped her hands four times and commanded the ghost to rap back. Four knocks followed. As if on cue, Katie responded by making soundless finger-snapping gestures that in turn were answered with raps. Taking pity upon her terrified mother, Katie then offered a hint of explanation for the sounds. Oh, mother, I know what it is. Tomorrow is April Fool Day, and it's somebody trying to fool us, she began. But Miss Fox apparently refused to consider the suggestion of a prank. The ghost, she believed, was real, and, terrified though she was, she decided to test it herself. Initially, she asked the ghost to count to ten. After it responded appropriately, she asked other questions, among them the number of children she had born. Seven raps came back. How many were still living? Six raps. Their ages. Each was wrapped out correctly. As Miss Fox later recalled, she then demanded, if it was an injured spirit, make two raps. Promptly, two knocks were returned. Mrs. Fox then wanted to know who the ghost was in life. Maggie and Katie quickly concocted an answer. The spirit, they claimed, was a 31-year-old married man, dead for two years, and the father of five. Will you continue to rap if I call in the neighbors, their mother asked, that they may hear it too? So that's the start of all this, is right? Like That is the start, yeah. And they, then the they, whole neighborhood gets in on it, and it very yeah, quickly gets out of the out control of, of these two kids. <laughs> yeah, very immediately. And again, like, they're kids trying to fuck with an adult, and then the adult just doesn't seem to get it even when they pull the april fools thing and it it very quickly becomes something like well if you tell the truth now like (laughs) right well it it's all yeah it it got out of their heads really quickly and it's also like a at this time in this area there were a lot of like this was like i mean this specific thing happening was unique but there were a lot of similar cases reported so it was like i feel like it's really often characterized of like they were just fucking idiots but it was like this had been reported as news before so there was some precedent for it and then it's when their older sister becomes involved that it really becomes an issue because i always i don't know 
I feel bad because I'm like, they were fucking kids. Like, they are fucking kids. Like, right, like I, I call them liars jokingly. I think they're children who had, uh, like, were fucking around and the adults around them, like all adults, are like idiots who are easily led in fanatic directions. And, and, and very what are you, what are you gonna do? Too. Yeah, and very, yeah, exactly. They're religious. Yeah. They're, it's like, it, it's like the kind of the opposite of a satanic panic because. I guess people right. weren't, well, They're I mean, that does it. happen too. That does happen too. There's like a backlash from the church in their town as well. It's a fascinating sure. story. They're children. Obviously, it's not their fault that the but adults, it's, when it's almost, have, I don't, sorry, I haven't watched South Park in a long time, but you know, a lot of old South Park episodes, like the plot would basically be all of the adults get it into some like, it like it it do something it, like get onto some insane bandwagon and it causes problems and like the kids are just kind of caught in the middle of it it's kind of sure. like that story like all of the adults in this town are just like immediately lose their minds and the girls just have to keep going along with it it's very funny yeah um, and then when, when their sister gets involved because they have a sister who's in her like 30s uh who comes over she's a single mom who's like kind of barely making ends meet and like basically sees an opportunity with what they're doing and like realizes that this is something that she can monetize so there's like so many different i don't know like the story as it's later told was that like the older sister was able to convince the girls that what they were doing was real and like but to establish like, oh, well, this it's not morally wrong what we're doing. You're just you're just passing along messages. And then the yeah. sister, the older sister would mostly um, profit from it and was always in control of the money and the tour schedule and all this stuff. So my yeah, feeling, actually, Jamie, older sister there's, a, villain. there's a place I might suggest our listeners go if they want to know more about this. Um, you actually might really benefit from listening to this podcast. It's called Ghost Church. Um, oh. And it, it really has a lot of fascinating stuff about American spiritualism in it. A uh, friend of mine made it. You 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 wouldn't know her. Um, I don't like podcasts, so <laughs> it's hard for me to listen to, especially if it's a woman talking. It really it bothers me. Uh, well, their you voices can, are so hard just, to just, listen. They're just so grating. Get get Is one of those woke? like mafia voice changers so that it goes like it makes her sound like a man. I just hope um, it doesn't get political because well, I just don't like when podcasts get political. Jamie, you may be a great candidate for my new device, the Jocko oh. Willick Podcast Voice Changer. If you want to listen to a podcast by a woman, but you don't want it to be woke, you just turn this on and it sounds like that Navy SEAL guy who started the grift of Navy SEALs writing books and making millions of dollars and now has a yeah. podcast. <laughs> Every like. Look, you want whoever you want—the lady from Serial, one of the NPR ladies. Uh, uh, you, you can make any lady sound like Jocko Willick and thus not woke. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm in. We also have a reverse device that makes Dr. Jordan B. Peterson sound like Kamala Harris. So, like, whatever you like. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I am trying to imagine some Jordan Peterson aphorisms <laughs> spoken in her voice. It's pretty <laughs> it's fun, very right? Funny. Yeah, exactly. Oh, boy. Making it, making it good for no, whether you're an for insufferable right winger everywhere. or an insufferable left winger. If you want to listen to podcasts <laughs> that you shouldn't be listening to based on the things you say on Facebook, buy our voice changing devices. God, what a long, pointless bit. I'm so sorry. Look, um, we got there. Right, we got there. So yeah, uh, it's it's the Fox sisters. You know, get themselves in a little bit of trouble. Um, the neighbors come over, and one of the visitors suggests like trying to create a code for the ghost that can wrap all the letters of the alphabet. And this really expands the number of things you can do in a seance. Um, mm -hmm. There's a funny moment where like the girls are pretending to be a murdered peddler buried in the basement. So the adults try to excavate the basement, but then it rains just in time to like flood the basement. So they can't continue the excavation. So like yeah. the rumors keep spreading and soon the Fox girls are traveling all around. I say the United States, like the East, but that was most of the United States at this point. Um, it's I mean, it like, it does get them access to like all these like educational, like shit. Yeah, that never would have yeah. gotten access to. Well, There's a, uh, what else Katie are you going to do if you're a girl in 1848? Like, this is your best bet. <laughs> Katie Fox lived with Horace Greeley for a while. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like all this fucking wild stuff. Like, they, yeah. yeah. Their, no. their older sister gets involved at one point and like... Well, that's what I'm saying. The older sister yeah, is the one yeah. that's running the business. Yeah, she turns it into like a, a, a solid grift. Um, yeah. And, and she becomes a, a medium as well. And like now it's a whole production. 
Yeah, and and it's a it, it, the claim that Leia makes, who is their older sister, like in, yeah. in her version of events, which is her like claiming that this is all legitimate. Her, her is memoir that, is wild. Yeah, seeing what her sisters were doing made her think about the work of a guy named Andrew Jackson Davis, who was a best-selling author at the time. And Andrew Jackson Davis wrote the Divine Principles of Nature. Um, his work itself was based on the writings of an 18th century European mystic, uh, theologian, and scientist named Emanuel Swedenborg, uh, who, again, that prince that Blavatsky was hanging out, was a big Swedenborg guy, too. Um, now, Swedenborg wrote that all human experience was a fraction of a spirit, larger spiritual universe. Um, in 1847, Davin, Davis had like written his book, which kind of made Swedenborg's theories popular. Um, and this is the first time we get this. It's kind of like the early version of the, the, uni- the world is a simulation thing like his I, yeah. Swedenborg's idea is that the material world is like a shadow of the spiritual universe um, mm-hmm. and this is how the dead are able to be in regular contact with the living like the dead are constantly interacting with us even if we don't realize it because we can't see the larger spiritual universe um, yeah. and he had Davis had predicted that the truth was eventually going to like become present in the form of a living demonstration, right? Eventually there's going to be physical proof of the spiritual world and of the communication that happens between those two worlds. So that's what Davis writes in this book that becomes very popular. And it's worth noting Davis himself is a pretty good grifter. Um, He claims to have psychic powers that make him a human x-ray machine. So he would have, he would, this was, I mean, yeah, it's like Davis Swedenborg and like Anton Mesmer, like all, yeah, we're not getting into Mesmer enough, but yeah, he's a big part of this too. He, yeah. Those are like the the guys, and they're they're still. I mean, Davis in particular is still like hugely like mentioned in spirit. Like the yeah, the, we, we the place that I took a table tipping like a spiritualist mm-hmm. like demonstration. It's like the Andrew Jackson Davis building. Like it's still yep. super super present in and his their whole stuff. thing was like he could see through your body and tell which organs were sick and could diagnose health problems. Um, and he would also, he would have seance conversations with dead medical experts. This is exactly the grift that John of God executes in Brazil. Direct line of descendant ideologically between Andrew Davis and John of God, who's this Brazilian grifter who is having seances with dead doctors who give him advice on how to cure people. And then he does like psychic surgeries on them, right? Everyone after these guys is just taking apart pieces of the shit they say and making new grifts out of them up to the present moment, right? Right. Very little has been invented in like spiritualism in this like kind of wooey side of it that is new in the last 150 years. It's just different mix ups. It's kind of like, I don't know, if I knew more about hip hop, I'd probably be able to make a good hip hop joke here, but I'm not. It so. is a lot of like recycled ideas or, or repackaged yeah. ideas as new technologies become mm-hmm. Available because there's very few right. like practicing spiritualists now, but it's more migrated but a to ton of people the new age who are, movement. Yeah, exactly. New age is modern spiritualism. Um, In a way, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's there. Yeah, it, it's it's like it's like I don't know. Um, it's like the Protestantism of spiritualism or something, whatever. Look, and I'm into a lot of it. Theosophy is like, <laughs> probably more like the Catholicism of, I don't know, it's useless to try to make these comparisons. But whatever, everything that like we're dealing with today and like the weird New Age woo movement, the pieces of it are being invented by these guys now. Um, and so Leia, you know, decides, and, and I think, again, as a grifter, Leia's like, okay, this book is a bestseller that's what we need to like angle this as is like, we're the physical manifestation of, of the spiritual reality of the universe that Davis predicted was coming. Um, and the fact that all of this starts to go viral in local news stories, um, just sort of causes an eruption of this very shallowly buried desire for supernatural communication. And again, people, always wish that they could talk with their dead loved ones, right? That's probably as long as there have been humans, there has been a desire to like communicate with people who are gone. Yeah, um, like versions of seances had been happening for like thousands of absolutely. years. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This And so once this, people very quickly, and obviously there is a kind of conservative religious backlash against this. We're not going to get into that a lot because that's not the story we're telling today. Um, but mo- most regular people um, are pretty happy to like buy into this, at least for a little while. And the idea takes off like fucking gangbusters. Uh, Maggie and her sisters visit New York City in 1850. And in short order, they were 
were feted and appeared in front of some of the most prominent people of the city doing their medium shtick, uh, including James Finnamore Cooper. Uh, they raised his sister for a post-mortem conversation, um, and Cooper uh, walks away very impressed. So suddenly, spiritualism is everywhere. Magazines and newspapers launched. The mediums set up, or mediums set up shop in every state. People immediately start co- uh, copying the Fox sisters, and most of them are teenage girls and young women. Um, yeah, yeah, which is which is like a yeah. cool. <laughs> That's part of like, and and that happens in the second revival of spiritualism too. Is like it's yeah. a way for like one of the only ways in America for like a woman to be a spiritual leader. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the the Shakers were kind of one of the only other movements where that was possible. That it was like a woman. Well, like in, in, in this religion. period, there's a degree to which the Southern Baptists are doing some of that. Um, but but you know we we talk about that this week. Like that was one of the things that had made them controversial more in like the 1600s. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like, and and, so this is, there's a, there's an ability to like gain social mobility as a young woman by doing this, some control over your own life, some money. And also it's justified in like their quote unquote theology. The idea is that, uh, young women and girls have pure souls if they're virgins, which you have to assume, like you're always going to claim you are. Um, and that makes them easy conduits for the spirit world. Is that they're right. they're pure, which also yeah. like it like you know blows back in the expected way where it's like as spiritualism goes on, women are uh, mediums, but like men write the theory and the history yes. and all this stuff. So they're they it's they're still disenfranchised, and, but and that's one of the things that makes Blavatsky different. Um, but yeah. yes, exactly, uh, she controlled the narrative. Yeah. Now, by 1854, spiritualists claimed there were between one and two million spiritualists in the United States. So obviously- That's fake. That's fake. That's yeah. for sure. But a lot, yeah. certainly hundreds of thousands. Um, a lot. And it depends yeah. on how you like, not necessarily spiritualists in that this was the center of their theology, because most people don't become spiritualists in that they discard everything else. But, but it's like, no, well, it's I'm like still like a Baptist or a Catholic, religion. but I also believe this person can talk to the dead, you know? Yeah, that which fits is still in with kind my Catholicism of, or whatever. Yeah, which is still kind of how it uh, functions today. Like it's it can, most religion it is syncretic well. for most people. Yeah. Um, my mom, I don't think ever knew a goddamn thing about Hinduism, um, and was just kind of more or less Christian all her life, but believed very strongly in reincarnation. Just like people do this, right? This is just how human beings are. You take bits and pieces yeah. of what other people I mean, tell you, and you incorporate it into your, and that's fine. There's a um, lot of spiritualism stuff that I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, yeah, it, it's whatever. I don't care. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, a lot of people are into spiritual. And again, it's probably useless mm-hmm. to say they're spiritualists, but I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if one to two million Americans became convinced that like you could talk to ghosts through mediums. Um, right, and it, a lot of this also had to do with the fact that it's like, I don't know. I feel like that also gets like lost in the discussion sometimes of like this was a science or th- or sorry, this was a religion that was presented itself and still presents itself as like yes. well we're backed by science and like we are, this was we will a be time where into like that. yeah. It was yeah, which I know Blavatsky, you know, goes nuts on as well. Like Oh yes. Yeah. Um yeah, they uh which I think is why so many people were willing to buy into it was cuz there was so much science shit they never would have believed yes, was possible being proven. So they're like, well, why yeah, not this? Yeah, we'll, we'll be getting to that. But that that is a huge, like the fact that this is a time in which for the first time in history, people are like starting to invent things that like you can't imagine some guy zapping into the world out of like a lightning bolt, like a sword or whatever. Like you can imagine some sort of, but like once you have like automotives and electric lights, <laughs> it does seem a bit different. <laughs> right. You're um, like, okay, yeah, sure. We can talk to ghosts. Why fucking not? Yeah. I can imagine some fucking ancient giant building this big statue or whatever, but like, yeah, now, now things are going to, anyway, whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, by the time Blavatsky makes it to the United States in 1873, spiritualism has passed its first great wave. And a lot of po- folks probably figured it was dying out. Um, Helena Blavatsky may in because fact have thought so. Because of the Civil War. That was why a lot of, of that, it like peaked in the Civil War and then yeah. declined. 
Yeah, and so it's decline. It's it's well past its height at this period, and this probably is probably why for the first year or so she's in the United States. Blavatsky doesn't really make any effort to establish herself as a guru, uh, legitimately destitute. Who f- her first move in the city? Now she is still a grifter, so she moves there and she immediately tries to like notifies the New York Sun that she has arrived in the city <laughs> because she's a noble woman, sure. right? Right. Um, and there is a lot less happening she's in the world back then. So the Sun sends a sends a reporter, Anna Ballard, to interview Blavatsky at the house where she lived with several working class immigrant families. Uh, Blavatsky claims that she and a number of other aristocratic Russian women had been studying medicine in Zurich to become actual doctors, which is not a thing that a lot of women can do in this time. Uh, When suddenly the emperor of Russia changed his mind and forbade women from learning men's trades. And she was like, and so all of these women who had learned science, we all had to flee to the four corners of the world to not go back to Russia. So that's like, that's the first like I don't know what her grift plan for this was. There must have been one. She wouldn't reach out to the sun for nothing. Right. This isn't going Um, nowhere. But but where is this going? It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't work. Uh, The sun runs this as front page news on July 28th, but they don't mention her name. Uh, They end the story with the words, quote, these accomplished women, polyglots, travelers, scientists, nearly moneyless, are able to do much and want something to do. But like, it's just a human interest story and they don't name her. So she doesn't actually, there's no. Oh, interesting. She doesn't get shit from this. Um, So she had been hoping this would kind of work as a want ad and like she would be able to get some sort of a job or uh, some sort of attention she could turn into money from it, but it doesn't. So she languishes for a while. She uses her mystique as a Russian countess to like, she's able to convince people. She is a Russian countess and she's able to convince people to like, she gets a job writing advertising cards and stuff. Like she gets a couple of weird gigs because people are impressed by her background, but she can't really hack it with any more substantial work. She like tries to be a leather worker at one point and just is no good at it. So frustrated, she lapses into her girlhood habit of telling stories about the supernatural. Her Mm. biographer Mead writes, quote, Apart from spooky stories, Helena amiably dispensed information about people's pasts to anyone who asked. Miss Parker, for one, was greatly startled to hear about incidents in her own life that were, she thought, only known to herself. When she asked to be put in touch with her dead mother, Helena refused. Her mother, progressed beyond reach, involved herself in higher matters now. Since Madame continually claimed to be under the authority of unseen powers, Elizabeth and the others at 222 Madison assumed she must be speaking of her spirit guides and naturally concluded that she was a spiritualist. Hmm. So she's doing cold reading on these people, right? Like whenever someone's like, oh, they knew things about me, it's probably because, okay, did they start by asking a series of questions that they then turn into like a revelation, you know? Right, like leading questions. And then if they start to ask for things that are too specific and you don't know anything about them in advance, then you say, oh, they're, you you redirect or you're just They're concerned with higher matters, yeah. Right, yeah. So that that sounds like a classic, like I I didn't know anything about you before you entered the room kind of thing. Now, they assume she's a spiritualist because of what she's doing. And again, Cold sure. reading, this is like the period in which it's invented. She's one of the first people doing this, at least in an, in a, in an organized way. Um, and well, she yeah, was, I mean, spirit, spiritualists, yeah. if, you were, if you were a medium that didn't get busted, you were really good at doing yeah. that. <laughs> now, the voices that she claimed to hear were not, in her mind, the dead or spirits of any kind. She insisted that they were real living men. Her master, Moria, and Kut Humi, who's, I guess, also her master, but he's always called Kut Humi, and the other one's usually just called the master. Now, she insisted, again, that these are real-ass dudes who live in Tibet, that she had, like, met and stuff. They just are keeping up the conversation via psychic phone calls. Um, So... Blavatsky, again, it's she's assumed to be a spiritualist by the first people who like meet her doing mystic stuff, but that's not really what she's doing. Um, right. And for more than a year, she just kind of runs through friends, fails at a couple of businesses. She nearly burns down her apartment building because she smokes a pound a day of tobacco. Um, <laughs> okay. Like that's that's probably know. true. Like literally a pound a day of tobacco. Um, Holy cow. <laughs> it's fucking dope. That's <laughs> rad as hell. That's just cool. That's just hot girl shit. That's um, just hot girl shit, bro. That is hot girl shit, Jamie. We need to go a back pound? to the drawing. We need to go back to the drawing board on what hot girl shit is and is not. Now, you know what'll make you a hot girl? I'm so disappointed. Please <laughs> if stop you talking. enjoy if you start huffing jewel flavored vaporizer pods. Jewel oh. pods. They're like cigarettes, but more convenient. You can smoke them anywhere in an airplane bathroom in your cousin's basement. On the top of a mountain, jewels. 
Catch uh, the uh, addiction. Uh, you're, 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 you're fired. Oh, Sophie. Robert, I'm sorry. You're fired. I'm sorry. Do you not, do you, do you not, do you not like the delicious taste of Jewel no, tobacco? No, no. Everything you the said. The delicious everything illegal you taste. Said a pound of Jewels. Uh, what if, okay. If Helena Blavatsky was smoking a pound of Jewel pods, <laughs> just, yeah, that just would be pretty a interesting. a mountain of little plastic rectangles <laughs> underneath their feet. That would be a lot what I don't know queen. why that's a more pleasurable image. Mm-hmm. To me. Just, Just fucking oh. burning through them like 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 Jamie, fucking Jamie, do not influence him. Do mm-hmm. not. Okay, but if someone wants to do I, I'm a just fan imagine art of her Blavatsky being like, smoking like a pound of John Wick pods. with his guns like always like 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 that's Helena Blavatsky but just with like jewels switching out doing like cool moves to pop out the cartridges and put a new one. Can in. we unfire Robert? That's funny. <laughs> I mean, temporarily, but I can't okay. say it won't stick. He'd- All right. <laughs> okay. Well, here's, here's some more ads for our primary sponsor, the tobacco industry. Oh, we're back. You know, Jamie, yeah. what I like most about tobacco and tobacco products is their absolute lack of any health consequences. Tobacco. Huh. It's like medicine. Anyway. Back to Helena Blavatsky. Ask ask that hunk of my dad's lung that's no longer there about that. Well, maybe he didn't need that lung. Maybe it was slowing him down. You think about that, Jamie? Yeah, he's he's so much much stronger now. (laughs) Just like Helena Blavatsky was. Actually, she's in terrible health her entire life. Um, yeah, yeah, that, it's, it's that is one of the wildest facts about because she does so many like a lot of it is lies, but she does genuinely go a lot of places and do a lot of things. And I'm like, but she was like in pain the whole. Yeah, she's time. like nearly losing a limb from gangrene, and she yeah, she smokes a pound of tobacco a day, so her and lungs again, are just whole. Just be a just stay home and be a novelist. My God, that's not what she's gonna do. No, that's she's not gonna what she's going to do. A, anyway, she's just she gets an inheritance eat. from her family at one point. Uh, mm-hmm. Some sources say she spends a bunch of time living in like a hotel, a fancy hotel. Uh, okay. That's hot girl all, shit. Uh, other time, <laughs> others, uh, she apparently like wastes a lot of it on a farm scam. She gets like conned into investing into a farm that can't make money. Um, oh, that's fun. Whatever. Uh, she does a bunch of shit. Um, obviously, yeah. there's different stories about like her habits. Lockman says she was a teetotaler. Obviously, she smoked a lot of cigarettes, but she didn't. She wouldn't drink. Didn't do anything else. Mead That's another claims spiritualist thing that she's too. Like, is like they yeah. don't drink because they yeah. are always accused of being alcoholics, and that's why they have visions. So they're like, no, we're sober. Now, so I will now? say, probably true that she didn't drink, but Mead claims she was heavily addicted to both hashish and opium during this period. Um, yes, yeah. And it's one of those things. Actually, she becomes in like the 70s and stuff, like kind of a pot icon, like a hundred wow. years like after her death. But like because she's supposedly smoking hash during this, like Madame Blavatsky is like gets involved in like she doesn't get involved, but like her image gets involved in kind of the early marijuana. Uh, and now uh, uh, as of today, she's a she's a jewel icon as well. She's a jewel. icon. That's right. She would have loved. Yeah. Jewels. Um, Because everyone does agree she was a chain smoker with the kind of dedication that today you only see in Serbia. Now, in 1874, she was interviewed by another journalist, um, and it's noted by Mead that she was scantily clad on the floor of an apartment when this reporter, Hannah Wolf, starts to talk to her. Um, And Wolf, I think, right, works for the Post and gets, like, fascinated by her, follows her around. She, she, like, uh, Blavatsky tells her about fighting with Garibaldi and, like, shows her her scars. Uh, Mm -hmm. Wolf claims that Blavatsky tells her about the benefits of opium and hash for inciting the imagination. Um, Not inaccurate. Yeah, she she charms this reporter who's a reasonably well-connected person. And through this reporter, she meets a friend of Hannah's named um, Mr. W., uh, who the two get in the subject of spiritualism and Mr. W is into seances and Blavatsky claims, I don't know anything about what spiritualism. What does the W stand for? We don't know. In her biographies, there's a shitload of like Mr. X and Y and random letters. Like it's very <laughs> Mr. frustrating. Mr. X. Why? She is one of the most annoying people to read about because like every third page is a five page digression about people from 150 years ago. An you never unverifiable to know about. person. Like, have, yeah. Having unver and having unverifiable <laughs> arguments that are central to the point being made by the biographer but also <laughs> completely impossible to back up. If you don't want to like rocks. raise eyebrows, don't name people Mr. W. Like what the Well, 
I think don't think that's his Christian name. So Mr. <laughs> w is a fan of spiritualism and Blavatsky probably she must be lying because even if even though she's certainly full of shit about a bunch of stuff, she's very well educated on the occult and on religion. There's no mm. way that in 1874 she didn't know what spiritualism is. But she no, claims like, oh, I've never heard of spiritualism. Yes. Okay. What do you call it? A, a seance? Yes. Let's go to this seance. And that sounds very exciting. Um, well, that just sounds like she's going to go and then yeah. all of a sudden perform very well there. And, oh, oh, really? Like, Interesting, mind. Jamie. Yeah. You seem to so is that it. exactly what happens? Yeah. I'm going to quote yeah. from me again here. Soon okay. after that, she met Hannah and Mr. W on the street and animatedly informed them that as a result of the medium's lecture, she had began to develop occult powers. Having placed some photographs in a bureau, she found to her astonishment that spirits had tinted them like watercolor paintings. She invited Hannah and Mr. W back to the cheap apartment she shared with three journalists. Her roommates were two men and a woman, a decidedly bohemian arrangement for the 1870s, but at least she had a small bedroom of her own off the dining room. When Hannah and Mr. W stopped in to see the spirit spirit art, Helena led them to a sideboard in the dining room, pulled out some colored pictures, and explained that the coloring seemed chiefly to be done in the night and when nature was in her negative mood. Hannah did not believe this for a minute. Speaking privately to the other residents of the apartment, she learned that they too had been skeptical of Madame's occult powers and had laid wait for the spirit who worked in the night watches and had discovered it materialized in the form of Madame Lavatsky, dressed... <laughs> um, so yeah, like they had... Uh, yeah, so she was uh, lying. Like caught her. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so at this stage, again, she's not good enough to like trick her friends. And she probably lives with journalists in part because journalists are like bohemian weirdos and more into the living in that kind of an arrangement. But also she's desperately trying to get attention for something, right? That's why all of the first people she starts talking to in the U.S. are press. She like really wants right. to get her name out there, right? Um, mm -hmm. She gets that, you know, no press is bad press. Um, so Hannah Wolf kind of quickly, well, not all that quickly, but eventually does realize, well, this lady's maybe full of shit and I don't need to be hanging out with her too much. Um, but Blavatsky sends her a manuscript, uh, which she claims is a satire of American politics. The way she, Blavatsky describes it, she's basically written okay. Confederacy of like dunces. Um, <laughs> and Hannah Wolf starts reading it and is like, this is number one, this is very bad. But number two, like this seems really weird. Like none of it reads properly. And she's like hanging out with some mutual friends who like are also friends of Blavatsky and shows okay. it to them. And they're like, so like a couple of weeks ago, we gave this lady a Russian book and she just translated it into English and replaced czar with president. And that's what she's claiming <laughs> is a satire of American politics. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. She mm. got their asses. That is, she got their that asses. Is so um, weird. Yeah. It, it so, is, it's funny because it's like there's yeah. a lot of her, the way you're describing a lot of her behavior it's like, okay, what's the end game? Like, it sounds like she's trying to, like, piggyback onto the adjacent movements to what she was trying to do in other locations. But, like, what's the end game? What is the end game? Well, you yeah. know what the end game for us is, Jamie? What? When the FDA comes after us for the vast racketeering scheme that I've, yeah. I've put together. Um, Look, oh, I didn't realize of that we were allowed to talk oh, about yeah. that on mic. We are, we are allowed to talk to that. Uh, oh. Uncle Robert's ghost potion makes you into ghost a ghost. Ghost potion. Uh, see, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm selling uh, I'm selling uh, ectoplasm that stores well in your crevices and releases there you go. Uh, on demand. Mm -hmm. Yep. So buy our ghost potions and crevice goo. I don't We're know. We're taking why this shit on the this road. This isn't time for an ad, you know. Anyway. Oh. Uh, so she moves after this, you know, things with Hannah fall apart. And with those friends, this happens a couple of times early on is like she's people moving around New York City she's or an artist. Yeah, she's moving around okay. New York City because she's okay. a con artist. Uh, she does at this point grow her hair out into what Mead describes as a blonde afro, which I desperately want to see a picture of. There do not appear to be extant ones, but that sounds incredible. Based on how she looked as an, I can't imagine it. Neither can I. I don't know what the fuck that could have looked like. It doesn't seem like it would be possible with her hair texture. No, okay? no. If you look up pictures of Helena Blavatsky and try to imagine her in a blonde afro, someone will get one I'm of those AIs on it. Um, oh, God. It's very funny to think about. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so this is, again, summer of 1874. She sets a new motto for herself. Try, right? Don't, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you're trying, just try. 
Quote, to be sure, she had been trying all along, but efforts had been confined to the realm of the impractical. Perhaps it was time to attempt something different. Laying aside her gimmicks, she found a way of meeting the much advised, uh, admired Andrew Jackson Davis, the first important figure in American spiritualism and a man whose writings were respected throughout the world. Even through, though the Poughkeepsie seer knew nothing about Helena, he accurately gauged her true worth and extended a generous welcome. So she somehow managed to like, manages to like kind of, she gets get this touch. guy on her side, right? Like, and and she's something that's she's she's a very charismatic person. She's good at reading people and manipulating them. Um, good and mediums yeah, are charismatic, yeah. For that, a while, that yes. she's going to plagiarize the hell out of him later. But for a while, the two are friends. Uh, she visits him <laughs> daily. Uh, he takes pity on her, her money troubles, and he gets her a job writing articles for a magazine called Psychic Studies. Blavatsky's mm-hmm. articles were interesting because she seems to view, she, she views very much the seance and medium stuff as not important and is it, primarily writing about it to make the case for a larger occult worldview where like speaking to the dead is more, more like a piece of a mosaic that's, she's kind of cribbed together from bits of half remembered, heavily manipulated Buddhist and Hindu mythology. Mm-hmm. And it was around this time running out of money and people who'd listened to her just say shit that Helena Blavatsky came across an article in The Sun by a fellow named Colonel Henry Steele Olcott. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. I didn't have any other. I, uh, that was the end of my reaction. That, that, was, that, was, that was just that. Yeah, that was a dun-dun-dun moment. Anyway, so <laughs> Olcott is an interesting guy. He was a colonel yeah. because he had, like, done some shit during the Civil War, um, mainly, like, organizational shit. Uh, Mm -hmm. He was like a a legitimately like really talented organizer. He's a lawyer, um, but he's also this guy. He like abandons his wife after he gets bored. Um, He's like, he's searching for something in his life beyond like being an upper middle class Victorian gentleman, um, which is why he abandons his wife and family. And he cons a newspaper into paying for him to visit a farmhouse in Chittenden, Vermont, where a spiritual manifestation had reportedly occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, he writes about this. These guys, the Eddie brothers who claim their Scottish great, great, great grandmother had been a witch and like their family had the ability to summon phantoms. So they would mm-hmm. like claim, they would do seances where they would claim to, to, to raise the ghosts of dead indigenous people um, and talk to them. And Which like, is one of the most sinister shitty fucking things of that spiritualists do is. Oh yeah live on indigenous land, know nothing about it, and then claim to be, it's just- And then literally steal their ghosts. Steal Um, their ghosts and make up history that serves their narrative. Just, And it's also, they're kind of doing, their contribution to the grift is they're kind of doing a puppet show. Like a shadow puppet thing is what it sounds like. Because they have this like closed cabinet that's like their altar. And they'll like summon these spirits and you can watch them like fight duels with swords and stuff. Like again, I think they're basically doing shadow puppets and claiming that they're like summoning spirits. Yeah. The spirit Um, cabinet became like a really popular uh, manifestation thing because it's easy to do kind of like magic tricks because the, there was a or those early spiritualists the Davenport brothers um, yes, that would do yeah, a similar a... thing and then Houdini like talked to one of them towards the end of his, his life and he was like yeah it was a really good magic trick that we yeah, figured we out pretty how to fucking, do. we realized we were good at puppets and decided to make some money right. um, yeah so Olcott he just seems to be one of these guys he's modest moderately successful and is very talented on like an organizational level um, mm-hmm. but I think is also bored of like, again, it's pretty boring to just like be a dude who works as a lawyer in the 1870s. Um, so he's searching for something else and it kind of seems like he finds it in the old cots. Like he's a little, he's a pretty credulous guy. So he buys this. Yeah. Um, he gets very much on board and he writes these incredibly enthusiastic articles for a couple of different m- moderately large newspapers about mm-hmm. this puppet show out in fucking Crittenden. And Helena sure. Blavatsky sees these articles and she decides like, well, and I think what her decision, I think her thinking on the matter is, okay, this is the first spiritualism related thing that's gone viral in a while. This is the first thing that's getting some real attention in the media. So if I get down there and I can get in, if I can get face to face with this journalist who for whatever reason has gotten people to care about spiritualism again, I can, there's probably some way for me to make this work out for Helena, you know? And then he becomes her Mr. President. 
down he sure the line. does. He sure yeah. does. That is absolutely the way this story goes. Mm-hmm. So she travels to Chittenden. She shows up dressed like absolutely no one else on earth, as Lachman <laughs> describes. Quote, the first thing he noticed was her red Garibaldi shirt, a military tunic and blazing scarlet that had been the height of haute couture for a season or two and was not yet out of fashion. Amid the sober dress of Vermont farmers, it must have been a sight, as must have been the Mongolian features that may have helped her in her Tibetan forays. Lachman's a little racist. After the shirt, old Cot next noticed her hair, a thick blonde mop that stood out from her head, silken soft and crinkled to the roots like the fleece of a Cotswold ewe. Then the massive Kalmuk face, full of power, culture, imperiousness that contrasted sharply with the dour looks of the other guests. This caught his eye, as must the fur tobacco pouch, the many rings that adorned her delicate fingers. So old timey writing is so goofy. It, oh it my is. God, He's, say get, less. It does say a lot about Blavatsky that Lachman, this guy writing about her much later, is like clearly taken in by her spell. Um, but that's like, how a lot of like women were written. written about who were a part of like women who had magic attributed to them, which is kind of wild because it's like at this time there were still witch laws, but this was like a unique moment in history where yeah. people were like willing to kind of forego the witch laws for certain Lachman, women. Lockman writes this in 2012 and like one of his, the reason he talks about her Mongolian features there is he, that's one of the reasons he tries to convince us. He probably, she, she would have made it to Tibet is that, well, she looked Mongolian. No one would have noticed. Uh, like that's I, pretty <laughs> fucking racist, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, like that's uh, what a, what a crook. He shit. also right. says that her face has like Kalmuk features because she spent so much time with them, which is also like, Anyway, That's those are like the horse That's some spiritualist shit. It's like, oh, it's yes, like uh, a yes, person yeah. imprinted on me. So now yeah, I look exactly. like Yeah, exactly. It's something else. Simply not um, how that works. But clearly, like, Blavatsky has been all over the place, and her, her dress is very eclectic. She's got stuff on her from all around the world. She, no, you're not going to run into anyone else who looks like Helena Blavatsky in, like, 1874. No. In, That's in for Crittenden. damn sure. Yeah. Uh, so this journalist guy, Olcott, who started to get kind of pilled on spiritism and stuff, is like, sees her and is like, well, there's probably something going on there. Uh, being the guy I am, I'm going to hang around this lady. And Blavatsky, she knows, she basically sees through the core of this man immediately um, and just takes him apart as a human being and, and like weaves herself into every aspect of his being. Uh, Henry himself later recalled, Her manner was gracious and captivating, her criticisms upon men and things original and witty. She was particularly interested in drawing me out as to my own ideas about spiritual things and expressed pleasure in finding that I had instinctively thought along the occult lines which she herself had pursued. It was not as an Eastern mystic, but rather as a refined spiritualist that she talked. For my part, I knew nothing then or next to nothing about Eastern philosophy, and at first she kept silent on the subject. So she Mm. lets him... What do you believe about spiritualism now? What are you thinking? What does this make yeah, you she's, think? Oh, she's cold reading him. She's literally cold reading him. I've had these mystic him. ideas too. And what you're thinking is based upon these things that I read in my grandfather's and yada, yada, yada. You know, she makes him feel like he's somehow tapped into some secret, like, oh, I know you're just getting into this, but you're really advanced in your understanding of the spiritual world, right? Right, because she needs something from him Mm -hmm. and he needs something from her. It's it's so wild, like how, yeah, I mean, her story and and a lot of people, it's like she, I feel like specifically, just really took advantage of how little people knew about anywhere that was not the West and just sort of invented shit. And, and, And the fact that like New Age leaders still do that shit to this day. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Even though funny. the information is now accessible. Like, it's just wild. Now, and it's it's interesting when you look at, like, what Henry started writing about her. In his articles about her, one of the compliments he pays her is, like, the highest compliment a man could give a woman in the 19th century, which is that he considered her androgynous rather than female. Um, oh, so he's, that's his way of saying, and I take what she says seriously. It's also, there's more than that, because there's also, because these two become business partners, there's this, like, series of rumors that they're fucking for years. And so I part see. of it, okay. he emphasizes that, like, I don't even see her as a woman you know um so there's a lot wrapped in there sure. um so it's that first night century. when they you know, so by the time she gets to the eddie brothers house in crittenden um you know olcott's been there a while and it's the medium shtick they're doing has started to wear a little thin for him um but it 
changes significantly once she arrives. This night, for the first time, they've been summoning different spirits. For the first time, they channel the spirit of a Georgian musician. And Blavatsky, excitingly, is like, I knew the man back in Europe when he was alive. And she has him sing some songs for her, and he answers questions and stuff about the afterlife. And Olcott finds this, conv- this is the first time that someone has come from far away and been like, no, they're channeling someone I knew. I've never met these people before. This must be real because I've never met them before. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obviously... Blavatsky sat down with these dudes and was like, hey, you want to really get this mark roped in? Like, let me tell you what to do. Like, you just say these things, sing this song, sure. and like, I'll tell them it's this. Yeah, anyway. Um, but Olcott falls for it entirely. He becomes convinced it must be real because Helena is, quote, a lady of such social position as to be incapable of entering into a vulgar conspiracy with any pair of tricksters. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that logic has never uh, gone gone left. Jeez. Yeah. Now, this was all incredibly staged, and the piece de resistance was when the spirit or spirits managed to summon a medal into Helena's hand, which she claimed had been a military medal that had been buried with her dead father, that like the spirits had brought back for her and stuff. The reality was that, again, it's just a simple sleight of hand trick in a dark room, but Olcott, being the most credulous man in history, bought it all, writing... Was there ever a manifestation more wonderful than this? A token drug by unknown means from a father's grave and laid in his daughter's hand, 5,000 miles away, across an ocean, a jewel from the breast of a warrior sleeping his last sleep in Russian ground, sparkling in the candlelight in a gloomy apartment of a Vermont farmhouse, a precious pet present from the tomb of her nearest and best beloved of kin, to be kept as a perpetual proof that death can neither extinguish the ties of blood nor long divide those who were once united and desire reunion with one another. Woohoo! Love that for them. Perfect mark. Perfect mark. Uh, And Jamie. Yes. You know who else is a perfect mark? Who? Our listeners for your content. Wow. Oh, that's where we're leaving today? You want to plug it? Yeah, we are. All right. We're done. So I would plug, uh, especially for this episode, if you want to know more about the Fox sisters and the history of uh, American spiritualism in the 19th century, um, that is contained in uh, my new podcast, Ghost Church. It's nine episodes. We just finished it. Robert's in it. Sophie produced it. Um, And there's, I have a a very, uh, I have a soft spot for a lot of spiritualists, especially uh, women improving their social station uh, through 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 tricks and goofs, and uh, there's a lot of talk about modern spiritualists as well, and sort yeah. of what they're up to now. Um, so check that out. Yeah, check it out. Check out spiritualism. Go find a ghost. You know what? Find a ghost. I truly am like, if you want to talk to ghosts, <laughs> like that's your business. Just don't hurt other people with it. You know. I don't know. You know what? It's 2022. Just hurt the right people with it. You know? <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yes. Like if 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 you've got a a good mark then mm-hmm. go fucking nuts. I'm just yeah. I don't know. People get so mad about stuff like this. Some and and they, sometimes they with good We're reason mi- and uh, other times with like there what? are there there are theosophists like foaming at the mouth right now um about I mean, about <laughs> this takedown of Helena Blavatsky. I don't know enough about theosophy to have an opinion on it. I'm learning in real time from you. Mm-hmm. Spiritualists, I, you know, live your life. I don't know. Yeah, go live your life. Talk to ghosts. Go create ghosts. Commit murder in a field, you know? I will literally pay you to watch. And I have, and I probably will again. <laughs> wow, wow. Jamie yeah. just offered to pay for you to <laughs> murder someone while she watches. So Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Yeah, become a murderer. That's the message of this episode of Behind the Bastards. Become and the a message murderer. of Ghost Church. And the message of Ghost Church, sure. Mm-hmm. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.